installed actually just over 48 hours ago. And this, this is now Friday Night View, Saturday morning for the castaways here in New Zealand. And I have to tell you, since I met with them, it's all kicked off. Anarchy, mutiny, conflict, but equally some surprising resolution. If there's been a lack of water, Jonathan's been at the heart of some interesting debates. You'd, you'd never guess that. But they have made friends with a load of dolphins. Find out more and see the dolphins. Remember, you can join me back here on BBC One on Sunday at night. Turn over now to BBC Three, the Castaway Exposed. Good night. <coughs> This is Castaway Expos and I'm Richard Bacon. If you've just turned over from BBC One, then welcome. And if you've just been watching Titty Bang Bang here on BBC Three, you are equally welcome. Tonight is all about Castaway. 13 very different people from very different backgrounds, all of different ages. None of them have ever met before. They've all been given very meagre rations to survive. This is where they will live for the next three months on the other side of the world. That will be their home. And right here on Castaway Exposed on BBC Three, we have the full exclusive Castaway story. Each week, right after the BBC One show, I will gauge the reaction of friends and family, the friends and family of the castaways out there in New Zealand. And, as well as that, I will be telling you how you could become one of the castaways. But first of all, let's see how it all started. They swam ashore, each with a small bag of belongings. First ashore was Francie. Next, it was Al. Then, struggling a little, Erica. Jonathan landed shortly afterwards. As did Claire. Our next arrival was Jason. And finally, Alistair. I like Alistair. Uh, that was the first group, and they weren't too happy 
uh, when the others turned up two days later. A boat! Where did you see the boats? Where's the boat? In the sea, unsurprisingly. Hopefully they're friendly. We're all doomed. Doomed. Oh, my God. Oh. Chaps willing to join us today? Yeah. yeah. It's a bunch of people as useless and pointless as us. Seven points. We're completely screwed, you know that. This is amazing. Over the next 12 weeks, we're going to be following their every move exclusively on Castaway Exposed. Tonight's studio audience, as I said a moment ago, is made up entirely of the Castaways' friends and family. Come with me over here. Um, we have the daughters of Francie, who you met on BBC One uh, not long ago, Antonia and Georgina. Antonia, good evening. Good evening. What did you make of that? I loved it. Uh, she seems to be loving it too, oh, which did, is good. Did you actually, Georgina, did you feel proud? Very proud of her, and in fact, I'm not. I, I support her for like the dissection of the sea urchin because I once got one in my toe and it killed. Yeah. <laughs> so good revenge. Okay, although she did seem to think that a sea urchin could be drowned, which <laughs> sounded like a, an odd thing to me. So it, 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 it must be pride, though, tinged with a little bit of nerves. Surely it's, it's an odd thing seeing your 56 year old mother mm. washed up on a beach with a rucksack on her back. Yeah, but it's everything she loves. She loves being outside and she loves adventures. So. Yeah. It's quite exciting. And as she said as well, that since her divorce, she really wanted to, to live her life. And I suppose, Georgina, this is, this is an extension of that. This is part of that. Absolutely. This year is all about doing things for herself, having fun, having an adventure away from home. OK, yeah. so you look excited on your face. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I wish I was there. <laughs> OK, all right, over here. Should have auditioned. Uh, over here, uh, we have uh, Matt. Matt is the husband of Erica. Erica, the lap dancer. Matt, evening. The formal lap dancer. Formal lap dancer. <laughs> Let's be clear, she is not a lap dancer anymore. Um, and actually, if, if, um, I'm, am I right in thinking that you told her to stop lap dancing? I asked her, politely. Told her. <laughs> I, word on I the street. I was there. <laughs> word, yeah, well, word on the street is that you stormed into a lap dance and told her to stop. I casually walked in right. and, and asked her to leave. And you're a nightclub security manager. I'm just thinking how casual that would have, would have been. Professionally. Um, uh, now, she, now, when we picked her for the show, she wasn't married. She then married you shortly afterwards and has gone straight out there. Yeah. It, it, to be honest, it would have been better for us if, if the, the former lap dancer had been single. You've slightly ruined the format of the show. Um, I know, but I've secured her coming back to me. <laughs> that is true. Now, you're in the sun today. Let's have a look at this. Here's an article from today's sun. Uh, this says that basically you had to, to postpone your honeymoon so that Erica could be on this show. Well, we had a little honeymoon while we were in America, so... But you got married, uh, very short honeymoon, uh, then she went out there, but you're going to have yeah. a... So, really, it's, it's been cancelled. In, in fact, in a way, this is the honeymoon. You could say that. We're on Matt's honeymoon! <laughs> <laughs> and what a lovely location, a television studio in Camden is. Um, thank you. It's a nice touch. Uh, over here is, uh, is John. John is the father of, of Ali Humbo. Uh, I, let me say now, I, uh, he's my favourite. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Let's see what the rest of uh, the UK think. He says he's been institutionalised by public school. What does he, does he mean by that? Does he mean that, that his judgement may be a little askew? I think you're right there. His judgement may be a little askew because of the sort of boundaries that he's been constrained by. He's yeah. not operated in maybe uh, the wider environment that some of the other participants have been, uh, yeah. been involved in, and they've got more experience than him. Self-deprecating King of the Ladies is something of a contradiction, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, well, uh, Al Alistair's a contradictory sort of guy, and uh, hopefully what we'll find out over the coming weeks is that uh, there's more depth to him. As, than... he, as his dad, when he did the um, MC Hammer thing, did you cringe a bit? Were you embarrassed by that, or...? or... Not at all. <laughs> I've, I've been there and seen it before, so... Uh, OK, he does yeah. it at home. Oh, he does all, all this stuff. Christ! Um, really? But I, um, I like him, and I think as well, he seems like a thoroughly likeable chap, and also we'll get to know him as, uh, as the show rolls on. Yeah, yeah. All right, John, thank you very much. There's a, a sample of the friends and family we have here tonight. We'll hear from more later on. And now, now let's try and go live to New Zealand. Danny Wallace, are you there? I am here, Richard. This is New Zealand calling. Thank you, I too have my finger to my ear. By the way, what a beautiful location you have there. It's not bad, is it, when you look at it, really? It is one of the most stunning places. Really, it's, uh, it's, it's delightful. I want to talk to you later about where you personally are, are living, but first of all, at the end of the BBC One show there, you set them a dilemma. Just remind us what it is you said to them, Danny. Well, basically, I asked them to identify the member of the group that has contributed least to the experience as a whole. And, uh, 
apart from that, I left it up to them. So they're going to go away, or they've been away, and they're thinking about who has contributed least in terms of teamwork, or who's been causing arguments, or who has just been getting on their nerves. So, okay. I mean, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I can tell you, though, that they did kick off a bit. Um, they were led, as you might have guessed, by the anarchist, Jonathan. Um, I think, in fact, we can see what happened. There's no way that part of my castaway experience is pointing a finger at someone and saying, he's better at this, she's worse than yeah. that. I want the he's whole group to stay together. So, so do I, that's very So let's stay together no, and let's tell not. these outsiders to stick it up their arse. And let us get on with it. And let us get on with it. It's Go away with this stupid game, we're not playing. Who'd have thought it? Jonathan causing trouble. All oh, right, no, who would have thought? I mean, I think by and large, Danny, <laughs> uh, Jonathan does seem like trouble. Well... Those are strong words, they're your words. I would say he's a strong character. <laughs> That's me being very polite. But yes, he is, uh, he is certainly getting involved in terms of uh, the group dynamics. Uh, in, yeah, in a way, that's a, a nicer description. Can I ask where you are living, Danny? What is your personal accommodation like out there? Uh, well, I was uh, slightly concerned when I was coming out here because they waited until I'd signed the contract before actually revealing where I'd be staying. I was worried that the big twist in Castaway would be it would just be me on a beach for 12 <laughs> weeks. Luckily, though, uh, I've been given a little place to stay with a roof, although I had to bring the roof from home. Uh, do you have to forage for food? <laughs> there, there is very little foraging. I like the idea of foraging, just finding nuts and berries, uh, but no, uh, I have provided for myself with a small selection of sandwiches. Uh, uh, thank you. Danny Wallace there, clearly uh, living like a king. Uh, Danny Wallace. <laughs> a king who likes sandwiches. Uh, we'll have more from Danny a bit later on now. Uh, you've seen them arriving on the island. Now let's have a look uh, at the castaways on their home turf. First up, it's the men. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alistair Humston. Most people know me as Ali Humbo. Well, at least I, I hope they do. I think it sounds a lot cooler. <laughs> For the last 10 years, I've been institutionalised in boarding school. And I suppose in the same way that Buddha wanted to find self-enlightenment, in a similar way, so do I. I think generally I start off quite badly with people. Um, if I go into a room with ten people in it, then eight of them are going to dislike me within the first five or ten minutes. I don't see huge numbers of people dying in some way or another as a particularly bad thing. I'm deliberately an awkward person. Um, it makes things more interesting. Well, I'm non-practicing Muslim, but it's not kind of a thing that affects my life and what I have to do or anything like that. If there was someone that I wasn't to get on with in the island, the first thing I'll do is tell that person, we don't get on, you have issues with me, you go your way, I go my way, job done. Badge over the left eye. Work proudly because it took a lot to get that. I served for 22 years in the Royal Marines. One of the most important things is a good, heavy knife. You lead by example. You, you live in the real world. You don't want to spend your free time there as well, to be honest, not in my opinion. I'm an unpublished fantasy fiction writer. That's the inspiration can come from anything and be about anything. I can look at a, a tree and think of a, a gothic horror story. I, it'd scare you if you were in here. It really would. I started drinking when I was 11. I started taking crack. I started using heroin. I had about five, six hundred pound a day habit. I actually died three times while I was in intensive care. I've been clean nearly 18 months of, of using um, for the last 25 years. I don't understand why I live in a city. They are horrible places. I am emotional, um, but I think that's a very good thing, of course. I don't mind crying. I kiss my friends, um, much to their disdain. Hello, gorgeous. And if I'm cast away, we've got to slaughter a pig, then I'll be devastated. There we go. Uh, interesting selection there. If you have got a view on what you've seen there, whether it's uh, uh, Al, the unpublished science fiction writer, Ken with his, with his knife, uh, then, uh, then let us know. Go to our website. Please give a comment. It's www.bbc.co.uk forward slash castaway. And as the series progresses, uh, we will uh, get in touch with one or two of you. Uh, next up, the women. 
I want to see how far I can be pushed, how much I can cope with. We're going to see what I'm actually made of. I'm a lap dancer and I'm from Bolton. It's just showing your body at the end of the day. If you're proud of your body, there's, there's nothing really to it. I mean, there's nudists out there. I can't stand close-minded people, you know, judgmental people. If they judge me, I'll judge them right back. I divorced about three years ago and started living again. This is the most remarkable tool and it's very heavy and very powerful, very useful. I always considered myself to have more male traits than female. <laughs> I think men see me as someone that they would like to be with, you know, kind of, I'd like to experience one night with Lucinda. I want to get away, escape all and kind of reevaluate my life and, and everything that's kind of gone wrong in it. Lots of failed relationships, really. Lots of bad luck with men. Mommy! I'm not cooking any more than this tonight. This is disgusting! Mommy! Shut up! My occupation at the moment now is full-time carer for my mother and their four daughters. I want a drink! I'm not doing it no more. They kind of lean on me and so do other people around me lean on me and it's nice to just give me time. I've never had time, ever. Margaret Thatcher's an incredible leader. She basically said it how it was and she done it no matter what. She's one of my heroes, to be honest. I believe, honestly believe that most people are conservative. Everyone is conservative and if I'm perceived by people as a crazy young Tory. I think it's one of the obstacles that you have to face in your mind before going on one of these things. I don't know if you can make spaghetti bolognese where we're going. I've got no respect for social scroungers. Don't like stack up people. You know, like really posh people. I've never really mixed with gays, lesbians. Maybe I can learn more about other people's religions, cultures that I may be a bit ignorant to. I don't know, sort of. Do you know what I mean? Well, uh, there we go, some provocative comments. If you know one of the castaways, please let us know at that website and also pass comments uh, to some extent we're operating like a tabloid newspaper. Give us a story. The address again, www.bbc.co.uk forward slash castaway. Uh, now, putting 13 strangers on a remote island is always going to throw up some interesting behaviour, especially having just seen the, the people who've gone in there. And to make sense of it, we found ourselves an anthropologist. Hi, my name's Mariano Hotter, and I'm an anthropologist. What do I do? I study humans, what they think, say and do. What interests me is what happens when you put people like this in a place like this. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, Marianne. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello. Very nice to see you. Uh, we're going to speak every, uh, on every edition of this show. That's First right. of all, for those of us that don't know, um, uh, I'm not one. What's, an anth what's anthropology? Well, anthropology is the study of humans, and it covers the physical aspects, our genetics, our evolution, right through to our oh. social and cultural understanding of the world. Turns out I was one of those who didn't know. There you um, go. So you're not really looking at uh, an evolution here, you're, you're looking at uh, behaviour conflict, I would imagine. Who, who's caught your eye so far? Well, they're a fantastic bunch of characters that we've thrown on this island. Ken, Major Ken... Is Ken, this is Ken with... Now, Ken is the guy with the knife. He's the man with the knife, he's the man with the, the marine training. He says so. that every man should have a knife. Every um, man should have a well, knife. Well, we're in Camden and here. Women. Everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> um, who else has caught your eye? Um, well, I think it's really interesting to see the, the people with their expectations, the, their strategies, and to watch them adapting. Yeah. So Francie, really gung-ho, really wants to get in there. But there I like so her. Many, I really like, I like her, her too. That's her daughters, by the yes, way. Yes, we do <laughs> like her. Um, it's really interesting, though, because there are so many really loud characters in Group 1 particularly that she's kind of taking a back seat, but I still think she's a really key player. OK, good stuff. Now, um, there's been some conflict already to it. certainly has. Um, one of the key conflict mongers, shall we say, is Jonathan. Take a look at this. <laughs> Jonathan, we live in a democracy. What do you think? All we do on... not live in a democracy. I think Jonathan is a very confrontational character. I'm honestly... <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you talk, it's conflict. It's unbelievable. I like, it's like it's conflict. I spoke a lot about getting to know myself. And Claire looks like a vehicle that I can certainly use to understand what I really think about things. In two weeks' time, every single member of the group will have an enemy. I disagree with you. 
What? You'll have three. Thanks. So Jonathan's actually been OK now. When I stopped, first met Jonathan, I got off to quite a tricky start with him. I'm actually growing to like him quite a lot. Oh, a Jonathan. Against me. Do you know what? We're best mates now, aren't we? We are. <laughs> Do you know what? That is fascinating. Uh, they didn't like each other. But what bonded them was the fact that another set of people later on came to the island. Well, that's really interesting. The threat has become external and so they've kind of closed ranks. But I think, at the minute, it's the Jonathan and Claire show. Jonathan really loves an argument. I mean, that's clear for all to see. And I think in Claire, he feels like he's found a worthy adversary. Well, that's it. I mean, and Claire, like him, didn't like the fact that other people had turned up. It was like, it was like immigration in microcosm. In they, many ways. It's almost like the first set saw themselves as the indigenous population, and in they came. That's exactly it. And, it's and, an and us and them kind of thing. Claire, of course, uh, a conservative. She'll probably be getting them to seal the borders um, before long. <laughs> but, um, but tell me more about what you think about Jonathan and Claire and their relationship. Well, I think it's really interesting because they, they really were at loggerheads. But I think Jonathan actually secretly fancies Claire. And as soon do as you? that has come... I do, I really do. Right. I think it's that, that thing in the, the school playground where the boys kick the football at the girls they like. That's what he's doing, but intellectually. Right, mm. really. But, so what, what honestly gives you the impression from watching that that, uh, that Jonathan wants to have sex with Claire? <laughs> well, on the BBC One show particularly, we saw lots of footage of him basically capering around after her, going, pay me attention, pay, pay attention to me, oh, be my friend, be my friend, and right. basically poking her with his, his words. But initially he was horrible to her, which is an odd way, if you're attracted to someone, to, 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 to woo them by being Rich, rude I'm to sure them. I'm you've done that. Oh, please. Come but on. Has a man ever come on to you like that by being a little bit rude and aggressive? I try Does and that... discourage it because I don't much like it. But it happens because it's a clear call for attention. OK, in the audience uh, we have uh, Claire's parents, uh, Richard, and ja Richard and Janice, ladies and gentlemen, are here. Um, <laughs> Richard, would you, would you welcome Jonathan into your house? Um, well, he, um, <laughs> no. he seems the most agreeable, very likeable chap. <laughs> yeah. um, we could give him an uh, application form and put him on the list. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Hot property. Uh, uh, Janice, do you like the... Uh, do you think, first of all, seriously, that Jonathan, as Mary Ann says, is attracted to Claire? Do you think that's legitimate? Yes, I probably do, actually. But then she has lots of um, male admirers, does Claire. Would you, would, you, um, would you like Jonathan as a son-in-law um, yourself if things progressed? No. <laughs> <laughs> they'd always be arguing, wouldn't they? Yeah, he I mean, would. they'd always yeah. argue, he's, he's a difficult really. bloke, isn't he's he? He's a difficult yeah. bloke, but I think it's a really interesting point. Claire does have lots of admirers. This is a very familiar sort of behavioural pattern for her. Jonathan slipped into it, and now Claire knows how to operate with him. OK, and also you're interested in what Jonathan said in The Lookout as well. Jonathan has lots and lots to say and he's got plenty to say about the arrival of Group 2, so we've got a clip of that too. Okay. It was very strange when they first arrived. Um, we were terrified. Uh, well, I was terrified. Other people felt different things. But we knew we didn't want them here. They're, they're the enemy. And to some extent, they still are the enemy. It's a very... Uh, I, I, we know that's his personality, mm. but it's still an extraordinarily negative and, and aggressive stance to take to these new arrivals. But as we said earlier, people are threatened, aren't they, when new people join a community? Well, yeah, but I think for Jonathan particularly, and he, he has been quite a crucial player in these first few days, for Jonathan, it's all about the pantomime and the performance, particularly because he's got TV cameras on him. So he uses all this sort of heightened language. They're frightened, they're the enemy. Um, but many a true word said in jest, and yeah, they really do think. feel threatened. He's being panto, but I think he means it as well. And I so think he does. He's going to be a key player to watch as the show moves on. I think on. the whole of Group 1 feel very threatened, and Group 2 are asserting their differences and making a stand for them being different. Can I ask you very quickly, Marianne, uh, Danny, as we've established, has mm. set them a, a challenge, and he's asked the group to work out who's contributing the least. Who do you think is going to get picked out, or who is contributing the least? It's, it's tricky to call. I think we've seen lots of players who have contributed a lot, but I think one of the key players is Gemma, because she talks a lot, but she doesn't have that many practical skills, so maybe she'll be the one to go. OK, thank you very much. Uh, mary -Ann, ladies and gentlemen. That's mary -Ann. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we'll find out whether Marianne is right on Sunday. Uh, don't miss BBC One for the next instalment of Castaway. But right now, let's have a closer look at where these 13 intrepid castaways have gone. 
The village was built in 30 days. 30 days of building for 100 days of living, all right there on the picturesque Great Barrier Island. And here it is. Here's my pointer. And uh, this is the settlement that we have here. It consists of three huts. Hut number one, to the left of the screen there, to the right of the screen, hut number two, and in the middle, the communal hut, where they go to, uh, to chat or argue or whatever it may be. Uh, as well as that, it's worth noting that, hello there, that they have flimsy roofs. Uh, and, of course, if there was some sort of storm, that could get blown off very easily. That's the roof of the communal hut right in the middle of their settlement. Uh, this is uh, really quite good fun. Um, now, they also have uh, uh, lavatory facilities of a sort. Uh, this is a water tank right here, a water tower. Uh, and, uh, and they have, as well as that, a hole in the ground, quite literally a hole in the ground, where all of their excrement will go. Um, and then up... On the top left of the screen there is a vegetable patch uh, where they grow their own vegetables. Eventually, those vegetables will end up there, in that hole down there. Uh, as well as that, they have down here a chicken coop. And in there, they have 15, very, it will be very important for them, 15 hens, uh, which will uh, hopefully produce some eggs and, and some of the food that they actually need. They also have a thing, as we've established uh, in the show already, a thing called a lookout. Uh, it's, oh, look at that beautiful photography. Uh, but it's over the hill there. There is the lookout. And that is where they can share their innermost thoughts, their private thoughts, uh, with the nation. Um, that uh, really is their, for their, their, their key facilities. Uh, we've also given them a book. Uh, it's called the How-To Book, and within there are instructions on how to do things that they'll, they'll need to know to properly survive. For example, there's instructions here on how to build a chicken shed. You can see it there in that vague diagram, uh, but that is apparently a chicken shed, I, I, I wouldn't know. Um, and all if you turn the page as well, there's also instructions on how to skin an eel. And there's uh, lots of other stuff in that book as well. Ooh, indeed, someone there in the audience said. Right, there you are, you're informed. And now, knowing how to survive is going to be a key skill for the castaways. Scrutinising their attempts at building a shelter, keeping warm, and attempting to cook is our very own survival expert. My name is Mike Hawk. My air of expertise is survival. I'm a captain in the U.S. Army Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets. I'm a combat veteran with over 20 years of service. I've been trained specifically in survival, escape, resistance, and evasion. 13 strangers on a remote island. I want to see how they'll survive. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the studio Mike Hawk. Um, Mike, you are, you are, I think you're currently uh, work with the special, member of the Special Forces in the States. Yeah, that's a fact. U.S. Army Special Forces currently. How long, how long have you done that for? Mm, been serving for 25 years. Okay. And that is your real voice? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and we saw Ken there uh, as well. Now, Ken has been himself, I think, in, in the Royal Marines. Right. Um, so he too has a distinguished career. We'll talk about him in a moment. But first of all, I wanted to ask you, what are the priorities for survival in a, in a barren situation like that one? Well, in any survival situation, first order of business is going to be to make a good assessment. You want to assess not only your supplies, but your skills. Then you get on with the usual suspects like the water, shelter, fire, and then way down on the list is food. Right. Why, why is food way down on the list? Because most folks can go anywhere from a few days to a few weeks before they really need chow, so it's just not that important. Right. However, our castaways are already out hunting for some grub. Okay, and we have an example of this now. They picked up one bit of food. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Here's the sea urchin. Ugh! It's like, ugh! Uh. You're gonna be, ugh! No way. Oh, look, okay. that one's walking away. I don't think there's a Should we just kill it because that put out of his misery? Well, I know, but how'd you kill it? Should we drown it? I don't know. Here he comes. We'll ask him what he... Well, oh, he won't know, will he? He was told us to eat it. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we touched on this earlier, but I, I, I don't think to, to kill a sea urchin, you drown it. That, uh, that wouldn't seem like a very clever technique. But uh, can you eat a sea urchin? In fact, drowning the sea urchin doesn't really pass the common sense test. No. But you can eat them. They're mighty tasty, raw, and they're even better when they're cooked. They're tasty? They're tasty. Who'd have thought? Yeah, you eat oysters, yeah? Uh, well, no, but I, yeah, I know that okay. you can. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and um, they've got fire, so they could have cooked it, but they chose not to, so that tells me right away they're not hungry enough yet. Okay. But also, 
I mean, they violated a cardinal rule. If you kill it, you eat it, or you at least use it. I so mean, they could have used it for bait, for fishing, for traps. They could have fed it to their chickens. Instead, they chose to throw it away. They've, so, they've wasted their resources, really. In, yes, in, in exactly. And for that, I fault the leadership. OK, now let's move on to leadership, because it's, it's important, I guess, that a leader is established. That did happen in the BBC One show that we saw. Did it happen in the right way, Mike? Well, I think there was a feeble attempt to impose some leadership. By who? What group. do you mean? Well, I think basically John tried to step up to the plate. OK, let's have a look. <laughs> the first thing I thought is that whether we like it or not, things have got to be organised yeah. and somebody's yeah. got to be responsible. So I thought the first thing we might do is we might put someone in charge and then change that every day. Someone will be the boss today and that'll be me. So it's good to establish a leader, but I think what Jonathan's done there is, you might argue, rather arrogantly imposed him. So that's not a democracy. He's an autocratic leader of sorts there, isn't he? Well, he certainly hasn't earned it and neither has he been elected. He just kind of took it and didn't give anyone a chance to say. And quite frankly, that's the only good thing I saw him try to do was a little bit of organization. Outside of that, he didn't task anyone. He didn't want to ration the chow, and he didn't even want to put people to work when they had some spare time. Okay. So quite frankly, the old boy chats my buttocks. Oh, does he? There's an expression I've not heard, but I'm glad I have now. Um, we get, we'll, we'll do this on Sunday. We're back on Sunday. I want to talk to you about drinking urine. Apparently, you can drink that, but um, as you have, I believe. We'll save it for Sunday. Uh, but thank you very much. Mike Hawk. Mike Hawk. Uh, now, the, the castaways are not going to be left entirely to their own devices on the island. On this show only, we're giving you at home a chance to have an effect on what happens, uh, and what's more, there's even something in it for you. Play Castaway Remote Control for your chance to win the experience of a lifetime. A two-week trip for two to an exotic mystery location. To take part, you need to spot the, the symbols hidden each week on Castaway at 9 o'clock, Sunday, BBC One. Each of the symbols that you collect will help you on your mission to uncover the secret location of the holiday. Do sign up now at bbc.co.uk forward slash Castaway. Uh, you may have spotted a symbol already in tonight's BBC One show, and I can reveal, because we're, we're giving this one away, it was a harpoon. Uh, the next one will appear in Sunday night's BBC One show at 9 o'clock. And I'll tell you here on Castaway Exposed at 10pm how we're going to ruffle things up a bit on the island. For more details, have a look at that website, bbc.co.uk forward slash castaway. Uh, remember, in a few weeks' time, exclusively on this show, together with Radio 1, we're going to be looking for a new castaway, and this could very well be you joining the other castaway members. Scott Mills will be joining me a week on Sunday to kick the whole thing off. Uh, before we go, though, we're now going to finish with another little chat to Danny Wallace. Uh, Danny, can you hear me once more? I certainly can. And nice to see that you're still in a very pretty location. Uh, I understand, Danny, that you've recorded yeah. a, a video diary which people can access via the red button. This will be your first one. What sort of stuff is in there if they have a look? Well, if they do click on the red button after the show, they'll be able to see uh, various things from behind the scenes at Castaway, including uh, the day that we revealed to the Castaways they couldn't bring with them loads and loads of suitcases. They could only fill a tiny little rucksack like this with what they brought. They didn't really react to it with happiness at first. Here's a very short clip as a taster. OK. Can I take a scrub up? I've got some gardening gloves. I think I'm going to get one more black T-shirt in there as well. Ah! A lot of just screaming at rucksacks there. OK, thank you. Danny, is there anything that you personally wish that you'd taken? I mean, I know obviously you didn't have the restrictions other than airline luggage restrictions, but is there anything that you now wish you'd taken with you? My local curry house and my local off-licence would have come in quite handy here uh, on the island. In fact, the crew's eyes all lit up when I said that. It's not <laughs> actually happening. Oh, that is heartbreaking. Uh, all right, Danny, thank you very much. Only a few seconds left. It's going to be big on Sunday, a lot of conflict. A couple of words. Check it out on Sunday. Yes, the big decision. They don't know what's going to happen to the person they choose. I do. We'll all find out 
on Sunday. All right, Danny, thank you very much. Castaway has now officially been launched. Find out who the Castaways choose as, as contributing the least and what's going to happen to them Sunday at 9 o'clock on BBC One. I'll be back with Mike and Marianne straight afterwards at 10 o'clock here on BBC Three and I'll be talking to Danny again to get the very latest news. Next week, watch Castaway the last 24 hours uh, to keep up with Island events. It's Monday to Thursday, BBC Three. And don't forget to have a look at Danny's diary as well. Thank you for watching the programme tonight. See you Sunday. Good night.